Hi, and welcome back to the Christian Minute. My name is Anne Markey, and I'm a Christian speaker and author and host of this wonderful podcast. And today I have another guest with me. His name is Matt. How's it going? Great, Anne. Great. It's great to chat with you. Yeah, I'm so glad we're here. It's funny, right before the show, we found out we actually live in the same city, um, but we're doing this virtually. So I kind of find that that's a lot of fun. Um, And I didn't actually ask you to tell me about your background because I wanted to save it for the show. So why don't you just spend a couple minutes, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and kind of what you do. Sure. Yeah, I I grew up playing hockey, so everything was hockey. But yeah, it's funny. We're both, we're 20 minutes apart in Edmonton. I'd Talked to a lot of people in the states, and they're like, "Yeah, of course you play hockey. You're Canadian." So, so that's uh, that was my whole focus. Though my dad's a, pap- a pastor, and so I always loved God and 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 going to church, and never understood a full relationship with Jesus, what that really looked like. And and so when I was um, eleven, I got shown pornography by a friend, and and that started. Um, me just on the path of of lying and and learning how to keep secrets. And so when I would go to church, I I loved being at church, but I would feel like I was the only one struggling with that. And then when I was in the hockey circles and the dressing rooms and and with my teammates, they would be talking about things, but I would say to myself, I'm a Christian. I don't want them to know that I do this too, that I watch this stuff. And so um, that was always a secret that I kept. And, and when I was 18, I was playing um, some high level hockey and, and I got hurt. I got a concussion and I had headaches for about six years. And so I couldn't couldn't play anymore. I couldn't really do much physically and, and even mentally. I was kind of limited with reading and just focus and things like that. And so it was a tough go. But in that time, um, I just started feeling more of a more of a draw to start helping other people once I had dealt with my own pornography issues. And so um, when I was 20 just about 26, I guess. I just really, I had grown a lot. Like God had grown me in in relationship with him and um, just started learning his voice and diving into scripture and and just knowing, knowing what it was to have a relationship with him for the first time. That was, that started after I got hurt uh, when I was 18, but grew through, through my, through my twenties. And so, um, yeah, there came a time where just very clearly God called me to start this ministry um, just before I was 26 years old. And, uh, and then it's just kind of grown since it's been almost 10 years helping people all around the world with, with, uh, pornography, uh, sexual brokenness, really, it leads into helping people with sexual abuse and infidelity and just whatever else goes on. There's so much perversion in this world. And so it's really, really cool what we do because we get to work with people in the darkest areas of their lives often. And, mm-hmm be a landing place for people to share things they've never shared with anybody for 50 years, kept secrets and they're able to get it out and find healing. And so it's pretty amazing. That's so awesome. Um, I think that's amazing because I know that, you know, so many people struggle with it. And I think the church historically has done a really bad job of being open about this. And I think it's nothing wrong with the church. It's just our own human nature that we want to hide, right? I think about Adam and Eve and what did they did? They they hid. And so that's the natural instinct. Um, but like you said, as soon as you shine a light on it, then that's when you can chase away the darkness and kind of encourage people. So I love that's what you do and that, you know, you started this ministry. Can you just tell me the name of the ministry and kind of like your goal with that? Sure. Yeah. It's restored ministries. So restored with a D on the end, um, restored ministries.ca. And, um, and then our main program is peer freedom journey where we, we walk people through 52, there's 52 video trainings, um, with work, but then there's also group coaching and there's one-on-one coaching. And so lots of different options. And we work with men, we work with women who are addicted. We work with women on the, the betrayal side, um, when they're the, the wives or, or girlfriends of, of uh, guys who are struggling, obviously. And um, and then there's a we have a free community, too. It's pure freedom community. It's for guys over 18. And so guys go in there and they connect and it's pretty awesome. And so the reason we do that is just because when you're asking about our goals, I mean, we just want to we're, we're already in so many countries around the world, but we want to hit every every corner of the world. And so we understand that not everybody is going to um want to dive in fully but if people can kind of marinate in a community and see even other people posting and get some daily 
tips or strategies or inspiration to draw closer to Jesus in their battle, whatever it would be, and form a community. It's 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 cool. So we're just trying to make a place for everybody to come in and get help, no matter what, no matter their like if they're a man or a woman or their situation or um, if they're willing to talk or not. We want to be a place where people can come and get help. So that's a bit of of what we're doing, and I always tell people. Um, my goal for you primarily is not even to get you free of porn. And they're like, what? That's why I'm here. But my goal for them is to experience the love of the father in their darkest places and then understand their true God-given identity. Um, because First Peter 4, one says that when we suffer in the body, if we arm ourselves with the same way of thinking as Christ had, that sin will cease in our body. And so hmm. we just try so hard to have sin cease in our body. But if we arm ourselves with the way of thinking that Christ had, like if we live in this identity that he has for us, we don't call ourselves an addict or a disappointment, but we call ourselves loved and, and an accepted child of God. It just changes the way that we live. And so when we can experience the love of God in these darkest parts of our lives and then know who we are in Christ, that's a really cool foundation for not only getting free, but also moving forward and making an impact in the world. I completely agree. And I see this all the time where you see a lot of Christians try to attack the prop like what they think the problem is but then never addressing the like underlying issue which you pointed out so clearly is if you don't know the father or you're not having that personal relationship if you haven't gotten to know him then there's going to be issues that you face and yeah you can solve those probably on your own but realistically it's not going to last if you're not dealing with that spiritual relationship with him. So I love that that's your focus. And I know that, you know, once you start getting to know God, I know for myself, it's like the more I get to know him, the more sinful I feel, but then the more forgiven I am because I just realize how much I need him every single moment of the day. So yeah. you're right. That, like that focus on relationship really kind of doesn't solve everything else. Like, I don't want to sound that it's so easy. Like once you have that relationship, everything else is solved, but it for sure tackles the actual fundamental problem first and then building off that. Yeah. Because if we don't know who we are and who God is and the love that he has for us, we're a lot more hesitant. Like you said, Adam and Eve, like we go and hide and we cover ourselves with fig leaves and we tell stories that aren't true about ourselves and and we're hesitant because what we do then defines us. But if we understand that God defines us and his love defines us and what Jesus did on the cross, then it's like, all right, what I did doesn't actually define me. And so we have to, I, I'm on this kick right now. I think, I think um, we have to understand really what repentance is and godly sorrow. And the, and we need the, the power and the grace of God in order to walk free over the lust of the flesh. But how do we experience the grace of God if we've got if we're keeping things in? And so we have to get everything out, and not like you say, not just to to feel the guilt, but we have to get it out to experience the grace and the forgiveness of God. Because if we don't get it out, we don't experience the forgiveness on that thing that we're keeping secret. So that's so uh, true. certainly true. We got to get things out. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Which I know sometimes, like you said, I mean, the devil does such a good job of convincing us that if we share the struggle, then we're going to get completely ruined and attacked and all those things. And so, you know, like, I think half of it is just realizing that all those voices that we're hearing of telling us to hide and to lie and to all those things, like that's not the Lord. Um, and I think that that's really helped me in other areas of just recognizing the voice of God versus the voice of the devil and lies. And um, I know that that can help in many ways. Um, but why don't you tell us maybe a, like so you've been working with this for 10 years in your ministry. So I know that you kind of run into lots of different people and can you maybe share some of the most common challenges that people face when it comes to either, you know, like sexuality or porn? Yeah. You know, the most common challenges people face are, I think it's probably what we just talked about, like understanding why they do what they do, because mm. there's so many different factors that play into it. And you know, even, even another verse is Proverbs 4.23. It says to guard your heart with diligence for everything we do flows from it. 
And so we focus on the second part. We focus on what we do and trying to change that, but we don't know what it is to guard our heart. And so when you start, um, when you start teaching people how to like what it really looks like for God to come in and, and heal those areas of your heart, all of a sudden they the whole paradigm changes because when somebody as an example, um, a really common thing, and this could answer your question too. Um, a really common thing is, is rejection. People feel rejected, whether it's by their spouse or by people they're trying to date or people at work or whatever. And so you feel rejected and then you escape into sexual sin. But if you can understand that your the longing of your heart is acceptance or the longing of your heart is intimacy. And so when you feel rejected, people are like, well, that's the trigger. I just don't do well with rejection. Mm. That's that's an indicator, but then people try to avoid that all the time, or maybe we feel sorry for ourselves. But if you can understand how to guard your heart and go, actually, when I feel rejected, one verses first Peter two, four, it says that, that Jesus was rejected by mankind, but he's chosen and precious to God. And so if we, we stop at the first part, but he's chosen and precious to God. When I feel rejected, do I instantly go to self-pity or do I go, man, God, it doesn't matter that they reject me. I'm chosen by you. I'm precious in your sight. And we dwell in that relationship with him. I think that that the biggest challenge that people have is understanding how to how to guard their heart and what that looks like, because we we try to we focus on the negative and then we try to avoid it rather than going. What is this trigger telling me about the state mm. of my heart? Um, and then how can God fill that? Because the reality is God is all sufficient to satisfy us. And one other example with that is people. With sexual sin will say well this is a physical thing how could god satisfy me if he's not physical but if you understand really what you're longing for is probably peace or mm. probably intimacy with people he can give you that peace he can come and satisfy your body and he can kind of, and he can help you understand what it is to first thessalonians 4 says to learn to control your body in a way that's holy and honors god and so he can help you with that um but 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 something that we don't often understand is that he really is all sufficient because we feel like, ah, he's not really there. He's not listening. He's not close. And so that's, there's a lot to it, but understanding the state of a person's heart is not yeah. often something that people have ever even thought about really, because we're so focused on the addiction. That's pretty incredible. I've never actually heard somebody approach it in that way of like first looking at, you know, like guarding your heart. And I know that we've talked like in Christianity, it talks a lot about, you know, what flows in, flows out. Um, so it makes sense that that's what you're kind of encouraging people is to guard their hearts. Um, but I think that that is so true that when we are feeling rejected or it's easy to kind of go straight to that physical versus like we've said before, you know, really digging deep and finding the core problem, which is like you said, finding acceptance. So I think that's really neat. Um, and I know you said your course has a bunch of videos, so I don't want it to, like to ruin that, but maybe you can give us a few tips of how we can guard our hearts. Sure. Yeah. And yeah, you're not ruining, ruining anything. I'm happy to share things um, <laughs> regarding your heart. So one of the easiest things that you can do is what you said, what goes in will come out. So, um, I mean, scripture talks about if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. If, if, if media, if movies or songs, music, whatever is causing you to stumble, I mean, why watch this stuff? Um, for me, I, I was free of porn for a long time and still thinking, oh, I could watch movies with sex scenes and I can I can handle it. I'm not watching porn. And, and my wife held me to a higher standard. And I realized eventually, I'm like, that's pride in me saying I can handle it because I started realizing I've got thoughts in my head that I wouldn't have like in the hours or day after a movie that I don't really want. And so I started realizing number one, that I had pride, but number two, that I want to value myself. And if I want to walk free of this stuff, I don't want to have these thoughts that I don't want. And so we, the first thing, even social media, like following certain pages, why do we follow pages? If you're just scrolling to look at somebody, it's, you, we got to understand the value that God has on us and that it's harming us. Um, yeah. And so that's, that's the first thing. It's very simple, like cut things out of your life. If, if something is, is junk or the eye goes in, if, if we look at darkness, our body is full of darkness. 
So whatever darkness you're consuming, um, some of those those changes are really really simple. Hmm. Uh, but then secondly, like for or, uh, Psalm thirty seven four, it talks about delight yourself in the Lord, and He'll give you the desires of your heart. I always used to think two things that are wrong about that. I used to think that they were more material things, like whatever I want, he knows that, so he'll give me that. And I think probably there's an aspect to that. But I also used to say, um, delight in the Lord, and he'll give you desires of your heart. But that's actually not what it says. It says delight mm-hmm. yourself in the Lord. And so delighting in the Lord is great. It's saying, like, God, you are good, you're amazing, you're almighty, all of that. But delighting yourself in the Lord is going, this is who you are. But that also means that this is who I am, that Mm. you call me very good and you call me loved. And I know that I'm accepted by you. And so I think that there's two elements really to guarding your heart is number one, like, what are you consuming? What are you allowing into your life? But secondly, are you allowing God to really love you Mm. in your heart? Or are you trying to get satisfaction from other things or relationships or work opportunities? rather than getting your significance from the Lord. And that was real for me. I'll share a little bit from my journey, I guess. Yeah. Um, I always used to say to myself through my 20s when I was watching porn, I'd say, man, nobody's impacted by me. Like nobody, no, nobody's life is different because of mine. And, hmm. and I would always tell myself that at the end of the day. And But what did that point out? That pointed out in my heart a desire for significance. And so I didn't understand that at the time, but I want to share this if listeners can, can learn from this. And so and, uh, something that we long for, that shows, that shows a healthy longing in our heart. And so I didn't feel like there was significance in my life, but I was looking for significance in how I was impacting people. I wasn't ever accepting the significance that God had for me. And so the reality is if Jesus died on the cross in the way he did, which was the worst the, the, the way that they killed the worst criminals is what they did to Jesus. He was willing to go through the worst death, pay the highest price for me. Hmm. And that's significant. Like I am significant. And yeah. so what I, what the Lord did was he, he called me into this ministry, but I saw no fruit for like three years. Wow. And I was like, what is going on, God? Like you call me, am I failing? Am I screwing up? And I remember one time, because through this process, I all of a sudden got a fire in me to to like just spend hours reading the Bible or clear up my closet, just had an empty closet was my prayer closet. I go in there and I pray just for a long time every day. And and so I had this this intimacy with Jesus that was building through this time where I was seeing no fruit in my life. And so essentially from say, just to give a timeline, like say 20 to 25, I was feeling no 20 to 25 years old, I was feeling like nobody was impacted because of me. 25 to say 27 years old, 28, 28 years old. I'm learning intimacy with Jesus, but I'm seeing no fruit. And then all of a sudden things started exploding and lives started being changed. But I started realizing that earlier in my 20s, my significance, I thought, was coming from my impact. Hmm. But when there was no fruit in my life, but I was learning intimacy, Jesus was saying, you're significant because you're mine. Yeah. So then he could bring the fruit and bring the impact into my life because I'm not now longing for my significance from the people that I'm impacting. And so I'm getting it from him. That's guarding the heart. That's being satisfied in the Lord and in that relationship rather than looking for satisfaction from the things of the world. So I hope that that makes sense. And I hope people could take that for their own story. I think it does. And I just want to highlight a few things that you said that I think are important that people may have missed is, you know, those periods of time where you're growing intimate with the Lord and you're not necessarily seeing fruit around you. Um, I think about even, you know, like Moses in the desert taking care of the flock for, I think it was like 40 years, (laughs) you know, and I think as Christians, we can tend to think that that's lost time, but it's just this reminder that that period of time isn't necessarily means that you're not lacking fruit is that the Lord is helping you grow into the tree that can then bear fruit. Right. Cause um, I actually grew up with lots of fruit trees in our backyard and you don't get an apple the first year you plant the tree. <laughs> you know, fruit comes 
when the tree is a little bit more mature. So I think it's easy to get really discouraged when we don't see fruit and we don't see impact. Um, but that's just a reminder, I think, to say, no, like the Lord is still growing me and I need to be patient in it. And it's really easy to give up. And so we need to continually going back to the Lord and, you know, like putting ourselves in that sense and saying, okay, Lord, like you've called me to this and this is what I'm doing and kind of trust his timing, which I mean, it's so hard to do because <laughs> now, I mean, you look back and like, okay, three years, no big deal kind of thing maybe. But yeah. in those moments, it probably yeah. felt forever and it's discouraging. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And constantly telling myself I'm doing things wrong and, and the yeah. whole time everything was actually right. God was yeah. withholding fruit from my life. So I wasn't getting significance from that. And yeah. I beat myself up, but the whole time I'm, I'm exactly on the right path. And I think that yeah. that's the same for a lot of people. Totally. And I mean, we've, you've mentioned it once already, and I think I just want to go back to it a little bit. And the key being to rooting ourselves in Christ and who he says we are. And actually, I wrote a devotional about who we are in Christ and our identity in Christ. Because the more I thought about it, the more I realized how completely and utterly it's a game changing idea that if you can really see yourself the way that God sees you and you can see how much he loves you and values you, it changes every aspect of what we do <laughs> yeah. um, because it, it, it gives us the right clarity as to his love for us. And so, you know, that being the basis of what you do is, I mean, I always say it's the right thing because it's exactly what God says is to, you know, you put yourself in me and this is what I think about you and who you are to me. Um, and when we focus on God, then things start flowing out and it's not us. <laughs> yeah. It's the Lord through us. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of fun to see. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Um, okay. So we've talked a little bit about, you know, when you were growing up and me too, a little bit, how it's hard for people to kind of like have these conversations with each other and Christians kind of be a little bit open about this. So can you maybe give us some tips as to how we can approach some of these conversations and how we can be supporting each other with these types of things? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, one thing that people always say to me is that's so good that you do this ministry. It's such a taboo subject. And I'm like, if you read the Bible, it's not taboo. <laughs> it's all throughout <laughs> scripture. <laughs> God is not scared of it. Genesis 3, Adam and Eve, they get kicked out of the garden. The first thing, Genesis 4, verse 1, Adam had sex with his wife Eve, and he bore fruit. And, her, and she, she, she gave birth um, to yeah. a son, he bore fruit. And so, I mean, every New Testament writer talks about sex. Jesus talks about sex. He doesn't, he doesn't talk in Matthew 5, put brackets around that little, little section about last, like, shh, whisper when you say this. <laughs> Only talk about this on a Tuesday night in the back room, like, anonymously. He talks about it like he talks about everything else. Yeah. And every New Testament writer does. And so it's not, a, it shouldn't be a taboo thing. Think about mm. this. Every single, not, I shouldn't say every single, but most at least pastors, Christians would say, hey, sex is a beautiful gift from God. Yeah. Sex is the thing that consummates a marriage or a covenant that most closely resembles our relationship to God. Yeah. And so sex has this power. Sex is a beautiful thing from god it's a gift from god so let's make that the thing that we never talk about mm. it doesn't make any sense yeah it's an epidemic in this world so let's not yeah. talk about it we've just mm. got to have conversations really and so if people are willing to be vulnerable at least to a point that really opens up conversations and it, it's cool with what i do right like i'm i meet someone and within a minute they're sharing some intimate things with me just because they're like oh you're a safe place you hear stories all the time and mm. people are longing for this. Um, even this evening, at the time we're recording, obviously, I'm, I'm going to speak at a Bible study for young adults because I was, I was asked uh, about a month and a half ago to speak at this um, Athletes in Action thing at, at the University of Alberta. And so I was speaking to these guys and they were like, we've never had a conversation about this before. And they're, you know, college age. And so, and they're asking me questions. They're saying, I've never been able to ask this question before. 
And so then they messaged me after. They were like, hey, we want more. <laughs> Can you come to our Bible study? People are thirsty for some guidance in this stuff because we all have a sex drive, which is healthy. It's godly. It's his design for us. It's a gift for us. And so we're told, hey, don't, don't have sex till you're married. And that's what we're told. Or don't watch porn. But this is like a really powerful, good, godly gift in our lives. And so if we can just be confident talking about it, um, I think it's huge. And so one powerful way, like I say, to do it is to be vulnerable to a point. And oh. obviously, I'm at the point where I'll, I just share things because I get <laughs> national interviews and TV and all of this stuff. I just talk. And my wife's like, how do you feel? People know your story. I'm like, I don't. it's the story of God's grace on my life. It's not my own story of shame. And so it's, it's cool. But if people aren't at that point, it's totally fine because I wasn't always there. Just share a little bit. I remember mm -hmm. I was 20 or 21 and my young adults pastor took me out for a, a coffee and we were going to start meeting with some regularity. And he said, Matt, I'll pour into you. But if I'm going to spend some time with you, I'm going to expect you to be open with me. Like I'll be open with you about things that I used to do, like watch pornography and I was like, oh, I don't want to tell you. But he had just told me that he used to struggle with it. And so he was the second person then that I told. And it broke that shame a little bit more. And hmm. that was all he said. I don't know any details of his story. It was just very simple. Um, and if people don't struggle with pornography, we could just be with a friend or, or if it's a kid or a grandkid even. Like, hey, porn's a real struggle in this world. Is that something that you've had an issue with or have you seen it? Or even like, when was the first time that you were exposed to anything sexual? Um, mm. What do you think that did to you? And it's all, it's compassion and it's grace. It's not guilt and condemnation. Um, I, I was, I was speaking at a, it's called, it's called man camp. If, if people are local in Alberta, I would suggest looking up man camp. It's June 9th to 11th. It's pretty cool. Um, it's by Bonneville, but I was I was speaking out there and one one guy heard me speaking. He's a pastor and he's been a pastor for a while. And so he heard that I was coming and he's like, oh, he was saying to the directors and, and to me, like, we don't want to guilt people. We want to be really careful. We don't want to put shame. And and so I'm just in my head, I'm like, you're gonna you're gonna see a different message. And so I preached and and it wasn't all about pornography, but certainly I talked about sexual brokenness, sexual abuse. Man, guys came forward after. They're like weeping at the front of the church. Other guys are around them praying for each other. Some people are praying for others. And then they would turn and say, hey, can you pray for me? I've got this too. And she's in my life too. It's all grace. It doesn't have to be it, 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 grace and a high standard. It's not like hyper grace, but like, there's a standard of purity. But we can talk about it with grace. And so if we can do that, then it doesn't have to be this awkward conversation that's so taboo and I'm scared to talk about it. We can just be confident and talk about it because it's something that Jesus did and he wants us to to do what he did. So, Yeah, no, totally. You bring up so many good points and I agree. Yeah, it's not a subject that the Lord shies away from. It's for sure, you know, mentioned in the Bible quite a few times, which shows us how prevalent I think people think about it or how prevalent it is just in people's lives. And it's just admitting like this is something people do. <laughs> Yeah. you know, let's, let's give you some guidelines. And again, I always tell people, you know, the rules that Jesus gives us, it's not to make us, you know, feel guilty or to make us to do something. It's because he knows that if we go and do those things, it's not going to be good for us. So he, it's like a, telling a child not to touch the hot stove. It's not because we want to keep them from having fun. It's because we, no, it's going to hurt him, like hurt them. And God's the same way. You know, there's so many people, like you said, that have brokenness because of their sexual past or their, you know, current sexual state. And so it's just good to remember that, you know, it, it shouldn't come of guilt because I think everybody at some point has struggled with something sexual, <laughs> yeah. even if it's for a few minutes. Like, I don't think anybody can say, that we're sexually pure. Um, so, you know, just re remembering that this is just a struggle like anything else. It's not less or more. I think as Christians, we like to kind of put sin on a scale. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, sexual sin always seems to be like a heavier weight of sin. And it's just remembering like, no, the Lord speaks about it 
just as he does lying or just as he does all these other things. And we talk about those things, right? Um, yeah. yeah. So yeah. It's, you're so right that with anything, once we show our vulnerability, people open up and just approach it with grace. Um, totally. And it's what we've done, but also what's happened to us too, right? Like there's so many people who have been abused in some way or violated sexually. And it's so sad. I, I mean, I don't know the numbers, but I would say over half the people that we work with have been abused in some way. And, and I remember um, I was 33 and, and God brought to mind this memory from when I was 16. And it was very, very clear that I was sexually violated when I was 16. And I didn't know it for 17 years. I was like, whoa, crazy. And so I had this time of having to process this and all the insecurities and beliefs that I had and forgive the people that did it. And yeah. anyways, because of the nature of how I am, I guess, in the ministry, I just share things. And so I shared very shortly after this with one of the groups that I was leading. Yeah. And, and this guy, one of the guys in the group, he was going to share something else. But then when, when I shared, he's around 60 and he said, yeah. Matt, when you were sharing, I just remembered that happened to me when I was 10 years old, the same thing. And he's like, I've never told anybody. And so mm -hmm. our vulnerability starts to lead other people into freedom. And yeah. so it's not just like uh, about our mistakes. We're actually leaders and we're leading mm -hmm. other people to freedom when we're willing to share our stuff. I love it. And I, it's so refreshing to just talk to somebody who's just so open and willing. And I think that probably comes from, you know, the Lord guiding you and just showing you that, Hey, you know, regardless of what sins we've committed, God loves us and he forgives us. And yes, he does call us to purity and to change, but even in that process, he just gives us so much grace and, and so much help. Um, now, I want to shift our conversation a little bit because my audience is mostly Christian women. Um, and I do know that I'm not sure maybe the stats, but that more women are becoming or have addiction or some issues with porn. And so I think advice to them is the same, but you mentioned something at the start that you also help women on, you know, wives or girlfriends who are in a relationship with men who are addicted to porn and just how they feel about it. So can you maybe give us some tips as to like, if you are a woman whose husband or boyfriend has, you know, a porn addiction or a porn problem, how we can start maybe having that conversation or how we can start like that forgiveness and, you know, I don't even know what word, but I'm, sure. <laughs> you know what I mean? Sure. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, I'll, I'll say first, like you can go to our website, restoredministries.ca, and there's a, a women's tab there, wives. I think it says women. And mm -hmm. and you can find help there. Like you can book a call. Our, our main coach, her name is Kelly, and she's great. And she also trains other people. And so there's help there. One ministry that's great is Hope After Betrayal. That's a different ministry. Um and on our podcast, there's different episodes too on Pure Victory Podcast. There's episodes for women in that situation. And so those are some some support resources that people can go to after. But the first thing that I want to say is that it's not the woman's fault. It's not mm. the wife's fault or the girlfriend. It, it really has nothing to do with you, you're not attractive enough. He's not into you. It, it really has nothing to do with that. As hard as it as that is to understand, it, most most men in our generation, like my age or your age, it, it, it was about 11 years old, our first exposure to, to sexual something. Now it's even younger. And so that messed with our brains. Like our brain development was messed up. Our yeah. sexual template or like the things that, we're, that we desire that was messed up from a young age. And so when that, that was far before the relationship, that issue is brought into a relationship. And so it's, it has nothing to do with the woman, but I would, I would say this is that often Kelly, our main coach, she says is it's like a hurricane meets a tornado when it comes out in a relationship because it's a hurricane of all of this confession, everything that the guy has done. But then the tornado of insecurities in the woman comes to the surface. 
And so yeah. what it can do is it, it just seems so brutal in the, in the process, in the time where it's first coming out, but it can lead to an even greater relationship than ever. Because if a yeah. woman is willing to look at herself and go, okay, all these insecurities that I'm feeling, God's highlighting those and I can actually get healing on those things. Maybe mm -hmm. the wife could get healing for her own self. And maybe the husband can also get his healing. And these are things mm -hmm. that a lot of people will say, we thought we had a good marriage. And then it all came out. But once we did the work to get healed, our marriage was better than ever. Mm -hmm. and so it is a process, but it takes two to forgive. And I, I think that when Jesus says to, or scripture says to forgive as Christ forgave, it's meaning like he's on the cross in the midst of being hurt. He's forgiving the people that are hurting him. So that's saying like wholly forgive and, and quickly forgive. But yeah. I would say this, there's a lot of grace and understanding that when you're in the midst of this turmoil and it's just come out in your marriage, it's pretty hard to get there. And so yeah. it's hard to forgive, but I would just say, don't put it off longer than you need to. If you mm -hmm. can work towards understanding why your husband has done what he's done um, and really seek the Lord and seek his voice, you're going to be able to forgive. And that's, what I think, a foundation for reconciliation. And it's also healing for your own heart when you forgive. I don't think it's solely for us to forgive, but um, like, I don't think forgiveness is solely for us. I think it's for other people too, but it does do, yeah. do a healing work in our own heart. And so those are some things that I would say, um, but there is hope. That's the biggest thing. And don't make any rash decisions on the relationship in the heat of emotion for sure too. So true. And um, I think too, like you first started out with here are the resources. Um, but I think, you know, like learning about forgiveness, but also saying like, get help. <laughs> totally. <laughs> You know, like there, I mean, we live in an age where, you know, touch of a button, we can, we can have support. Um, but again, it goes back to like that taboo of like, well, we don't want to talk about it. We, like, it's so shameful. But then realizing like, I think porn has probably touched every single relationship at some point or another, that yeah. it is a fact. And I think once we approach it in that sense, like you said, we can realize that it really isn't our fault but i think like you know growing up in the 90s purity culture women were told 100 percent. i remember like if your man strays in any way it's your fault kind of thing yeah. so i think our generation of women have to relearn the truth that you know it it, it has nothing to do with it like with us it it's not about what we wear or even how often we're you know, accepting sex from our husbands, it really, I mean, those things can affect each other, but it's not because of those things. Um, and so just relearning that and erasing some of that stuff that we learned um, is a really good place to start. It is. It is. There are so many damaging beliefs that were taught and all with good intentions in purity culture, but it just it was it was harmful sex is never the answer to a porn problem it's it's not like give him more sex he won't watch porn that's never the answer it just masks the problem because it's not a behavior problem it's a it's a heart problem mm. and, and it's an escape right like there, when there's hardships in life you feel rejected like we're talking about you escape yeah. into sin. and so it's dealing with those things it's not like oh he wants more sex let's do that and then everything will be fixed it's a lot of pressure on a woman. It's not healthy for a man. It's not good all around. So, um, but yeah, certainly get help. One thing that women want to do early on is they're a detective. They want to uncover every stone, every rock and, and find out all the details about everything he's ever done. And it just drives the wife crazy. But also it's, it's actually impossible for a husband to say all of the details because we don't remember yeah. all the details. Yeah. And so there are certain things that wives do that, that it's it's just it's hard and so if guide if guidance can um can be had it's a really really crucial thing for sure totally uh, yes we do like to play the detective <laughs> and i think part of our brains think like oh if i know all the details i can fix it all um but i mean in our marriage it wasn't related to sex but um it was something else that i it was just like don't ask that question you don't want to know if you know the answer, it's just going to hurt more kind of thing. 
Um, and it's not one of those things that really impacts our marriage. So it's just kind of, um, I actually have the, another podcast talking about boundaries and this is just some boundaries that we can create in our own thinking and our own thought patterns that can only, you know, that will help us build and protect that marriage. Just some things like we don't need to know all the details. Um, it's really not going to help. And I, I really love that you said sex is not the solution. And I think that's really a powerful message. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I feel like I could probably talk about this all day, but we've been going for a while and you've already shared some amazing places and resources that people can go to and get some support, but maybe you can just remind us of your website and where people can find you online. Sure. Yeah. So restoredministries.ca is the website and you can always go on there and you can book a call with, with uh, either me or the female coach Kelly and, and just see, it's it's not like a sales call. I mean, sometimes we tell people to do the least expensive thing. It's whatever's best for people. Um, yeah. Or just do the free thing too. I had a guy recently, I'm like, ah, oh, you could get this free thing and just do that. So, um, but we just want to help people. So restoredministries.ca. And then, like I say, you, you, you're talking about the audience's wives, but if, if the Pure Freedom community can be helpful for mm. husbands, send them to it because it's a free thing people can kind of just get to know us a little bit and and we do challenges in there and connection points for people um and so it's that's purefc.ca so purefc.ca for pure freedom community um mm. which is for guys and then we got our pure victory podcast too like i say so there's lots of episodes we've been going almost weekly over three years so okay. for about three years now so so there's a lot of episodes on there and um yeah and then if you ever want to if people ever want to initiate something at their church too a lot of churches are reaching out wanting to do events too because past now that we're past covid and we're a year past and the ministry is growing and um just word is getting out right so we're getting a lot of calls for events right now too and so sometimes that's a cool thing for pastors that don't know about a resource when they have people in their church go to them and say hey this is something that you could do or look at this ministry and then the pastor can reach out so it's just another way to make an impact and reach obviously lots of people with an event. So those are some ways that people could get involved. That's so awesome. And I just want to remind people that even though you're in Edmonton, you're trying to reach kind of everywhere. So when it's, um, and so I'll make sure to add those links in the show notes so people can find you. And I just wanted to thank you for being open and for joining me on the call and just for having this conversation. I appreciate it. Thanks. And thanks for having me and keep going. I love it. Thanks. Well, thank you everybody for watching. Um, if you have any questions about this conversation that we've had, please reach out and um, we'll try to answer them for you. Um, thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next episode. Bye.